What's up, kinfolk? Welcome to the number one college football show. I am your host, RJ Young. Thank you for watching on the Fox Sports app, YouTube, or listening wherever you get your podcasts. Today on the show, we have to break down the remaining top quarterback derbies in the sport of college football, and I'm going to tell you why spring football absolutely matters for those quarterbacks in those derbies and, frankly, for some derbies that we thought would be going into summer that are not. We're going to talk about our USFL Week Five power rankings as we are at the halfway mark of the USFL season, and it is all open to all eight teams in the sport. Really, really love that for the league. But first, let's talk about the news to drop on Monday. That is the number one player in the class of 2024, Dylan Rayola, announced his commitment to the University of Georgia. Commits to the G. And we got to talk about all that that entails, but off the rip, right? Because, uh, Javion, our social guy, is always like, yo, RJ, can you get to the front of this so we can do this on the Twitters? Here it is on the Twitters. It can feel like Rayola is Kevin Durant following Oklahoma City, losing a 3-1 lead to Golden State, only to join Golden State the next year, right? It can feel like that if you're a Buckeye fan because Dylan Rayola was committed to the Ohio State University until December of 2022. And then Ohio State played Georgia in the college football playoff semifinals in the Peach Bowl. Came up three points short, missed field goal at midnight of knocking off what would be the defending national champs. And then six months down the road, we got Dylan Rayola committing to the University of Georgia. I see it. I see it. And I'm here for it. I would like to see this Ohio State-Georgia thing continue to go on because, well, frankly, I thought it was going to be Ohio State and and Georgia. And then I thought it was going to be Oklahoma and Georgia. And now it feels like we're right back to where we were, where can you get past the top tier of the SEC? Now, on top of all this, Rayola had visited USC, right, multiple times. And you can see the allure of one Lincoln Riley. And you could also see how perhaps Nebraska would have been in the mix because his father was an All-American at Nebraska as an offensive lineman. And his uncle is the offensive line coach at Nebraska right now. But you take a look at what Georgia has done and even the dreaded casual in your family. The person who is going to talk your ear off about what the NFL is doing and not know a damn thing about college football knows, yeah, of course, Dylan Rayola committed to the University of Georgia. I would do do that because that's how good they have been. Comes out of Pinnacle in Phoenix, Arizona, but by way of Chandler, he made the decision to transfer there to get a better football career. Also the place where Spencer Rattler came out of as the number one quarterback and five-star recruit 2019. Also the place where Deuce Robinson is just finishing his high school career and going to be a tight end at USC, where I also hope he swings a bat because, my God, can that man ever hit the ball long and hard. I mean, we got a Sir Mix-a-Lock song going on about Deuce Robinson, and that was another reason why people thought that Dylan Rayola might be considering USC, among many, many other reasons. But I'm already to this point where it's a huge win for Mike Bobo, who is in year one as the offensive coordinator at Georgia and is following an offensive coordinator that, frankly, should have won the Broyles Award last year, but didn't because everybody believed he had Georgia. So nobody was going to give Todd Munkin his due, even though Todd Munkin won back-to-back national championships with a quarterback that was not only drafted in the first, fourth round of this year's NFL draft, but a dude that Kirby Smart had walk on, then ran off to play Juco, and then invited back on to compete for the job. All right? Like, I don't care who you are. You do that with a fourth-round quarterback and a former walk-on, you deserve to be a Broyles Award winner, but we'll talk a little bit about that as we go on. Now, question I had before me was, will Dylan Rayola do more at UGA than Justin Fields? Okay, Uh, I feel like the answer is yes. Like, we can all kind of pencil that in. At UGA, Fields passed 328 yards, rushed 266, scored eight TDs in 2018. But that ain't the bar now, is it? The bar is, can Dylan Rayola do at Georgia what Justin Fields did at the Ohio State, right? Again, Kevin Durant, Gold State Warriors, Oklahoma City, overtones here, right? Because in 2019 at Ohio State, Justin Fields passed for 3,273 yards, man, 3,273 yards at 11.4 yards per attempt. Anything over 10, guys, is elite, right? Also rushed 484 yards and had 51 total touchdowns in that Heisman finalist season, won a Big Ten championship, made a college football playoff appearance. Then in 2020, basically sealed his legend in Columbus when he played a significant role in getting Big Ten football even played in 2020, then led Ohio State back to the college football playoff, beat their nemesis Clemson, right? 
in a bowl game and then got all the way to the national championship game playing with what looked like bruised ribs because of shot that he took in that game against Clemson. The bar for Dylan Rayola is what I'm saying is two college football playoff appearances, a Heisman finalist, a national title appearance, a 3,200-yard passing season, a 450-yard rushing season, and 50 total TDs in that same season. But maybe that's not even the bar for what Dylan Rayola should be able to do at the University of Georgia because only last week, we talked about my post-spring top 25 here on the show, and I made reference to the Bulldogs are number one in everybody's ranking because they are the best team in college football and have been for the last two years. But they were able to do that without a first-round quarterback. And in the college football playoff era, They are the only program to go back-to-back with national championships with a quarterback that was not drafted in the first round, okay? We all know the story of Stetson Bennett, what he means to Georgia. But it is a place for where it felt like if you had a five-star quarterback, you should be able to do untold things, right? You should be able to win and win and win, and the score shouldn't be close. But among five-star quarterbacks that have committed to Georgia, played at Georgia, none has led the University of Georgia to a national championship. Not Justin Fields, not Jacob Eason, not Aaron Murray, not Matthew Stafford, and not DJ Shockley. I went all the way back for you, right? So that means since recruiting was a thing. But also bear in mind, until they had won that first national championship in 2021, 40 years, they had won one again in four decades, right? And they needed the dude that absolutely wanted to be at Georgia more than he wanted to be anywhere else to get them over the top. And even then they built it around what the defense could do. You can even say that Georgia has won back-to-back national championships in spite of the college football player of their quarterbacks. Not to say that Stetson Bennett isn't good. It's to say that you would probably pick six or seven guys that were better. It's not usually the kind of quarterback that wins a national championship, right? Now, with all of that, and knowing what Stetson Bennett was able to do, if you are a Georgia fan, you don't give a damn about what those other five-star quarterbacks have done. You probably don't even give a damn what Justin Fields was able to do. And you certainly aren't looking out west to USC and thinking about what Lincoln Riley's been able to do for quarterbacks because you can give Dylan Rayola and hope he can give you what nobody else can, a national championship. So if Dylan Rayola can meet the bar that is Stetson Bennett, which is go back to back and start a quarterback with national championships, I think they'll be just fine with that. Can't wait to see how he develops and joins what I think is going to be a better group of quarterbacks in the years to come because Stetson Bennett is once-in-a-lifetime type of figure. I don't expect to see that ever happen again. But you know what? College football is a funny sport, and that is one of the reasons why we're still talking about quarterback derbies, right? That's what we call in the business a segue. Now, there are some really interesting derbies going on, but, I mean, at the top of the list for me, we got to start at number one, right? It's Ohio State. It's Ohio State because Ohio State has built its reputation to the opposite, frankly, of one Georgia, which say the offense is what moves the needle. And that's also, you know, been true of most national championship programs, right? Including Ohio State in the college football era. Joe Burrow, Trevor Lawrence. You know, we keep going down the line here. Tua Tonga Valoa. These are guys that are not only great in our sport, but become the next great group of quarterbacks at the next level. So the guy that wins between Kyle McCord and Devin Brown Feels like the dude's got to inherit a machine that is capable of getting back to the college football playoff. Now, they will have to deal with not having beaten Michigan in two years. One of the reasons that Justin Fields gets to walk around being Justin Fields in Columbus, he's undefeated against Michigan. C.J. Stroud, not so much. Kyle McCord might get a couple opportunities. Devin Brown might get a couple opportunities. But whomever it is, that guy's got to hit the ground running, and he's going to do it with the best wide receiver in the sport in Marvin Harrison Jr. But as much as I've talked about Kyle McCord, and that's who I'd still believe will win the job because of his relationship with Marvin Harrison Jr., because he's the only guy that started a game at Ohio State as a quarterback, right? And because he's been in the system just that much longer than Devin Brown. But I would be remiss if I didn't say that Devin Brown can't sling it. And there's a reason why he's quarterback at Ohio State. And there's a reason why he's staying the fight for the job, right? I think this is really interesting and telling about Devin Brown because I could tell you about him throwing for 4,800 yards and 57 TDs at Corner Canyon as a transfer and new offense as a senior. That would be enough, right? We would all get on board with that. Dude could sling it. But what I love is my man changed his number from 15 to 33 during the spring. Now, I will be very interested to see if he wears 33 come the fall because that's not usually a quarterback jersey. Unless you're a historian, 
like Devin Brown, for which you know, Sammy Baugh wore 33. And the quote from Devin Brown is, number 33 is the original quarterback number. And Ryan Day is all about it. Brian Hartline is all about it. And you know what? So am I. You want to wear single digits as a defensive lineman? You want to stretch that zero all the way out? Please do it. Now we got to give that 33 back to the quarterback. You see, if the quarterback's wearing 33, that's got to change the mentality of your football team and the one that's a lot more physical. As a matter of fact, the dude on the other side of the ball that wears 33, Jack Sawyer. A blessed God, Ohio defensive end that ought to be coming into his own in 2023. Very excited to see which one of those guys, Kyle McCord or Devin Brown, can win that derby. Number two on the list for me, Alabama. All right. Now, it's interesting because we haven't seen an open quarterback competition at Alabama go into the summer since like Jalen Hurts' true freshman year in 2016. So it's been some time, but that's not exactly how Nick Saban wants to do this. He likes having the quarterback settled by the spring. It was very clear that come 2021, everybody knew Bryce Young was going to be the guy at the end of the spring. There was no derby whatsoever. Now you got what I think are three guys competing for the job. It's not that Eli Holstein or Dylan Longerin aren't talented enough. It's that I think they want the older guys to assert some control here, right? So you've got Jalen Milrow and Ty Simpson who are allowed to mostly duke it out in the spring. But either you don't feel like you have a guy or you feel like you need to make the room better because both Tommy Reese and Nick Saban went to go get Tyler Buckner out of the portal and bring him to Tuscaloosa, right? Talk a little bit about how Tyler Buckner got to Tuscaloosa in a minute. But that it feels like a very even competition because Tyler Buckner and Jalen Milrow provide you the same set of skills. Both are lethal in the open field. Both have their issues throwing the ball to teams that don't wear their jersey. Okay, both have issues putting the ball on the floor, and at least one of them has proven that he cannot get himself out of harm's way enough to stay healthy on the field, right? That'd be Buckner, right? But I think that Ty Simpson also could sneak into this because he's much more of a polished passer, and if that's what Tommy Reese is looking for, a dude that can hit on those deep vertical play-action passes, maybe he's the guy, also the son of a coach, and a national, excuse me, not national, Tennessee Gatorade Player of the Year coming out of high school. So. I think they got good options there. I'm just interested. I think it's going to be Milrow because, again, like McCord, he started a game last year. Difference is he started a game against 5-7 and Texas A&M. They damn near lost and put the ball on the floor, threw it to the other team. Those are are two things that Nick Saban just does not abide. I say that, but, you know, everybody wants to tell me how great Jalen Hurts is and all that dude was put the ball on the floor in pivotal games, you know, like the Super Bowl. I know he played well, guys. He also put the ball on the floor, and that's the difference in the game. Get off of James Bradbury, get back on your quarterback that you're paying all this money. Okay, I'm saying this as an Oklahoma guy because I also remember 63 to 28. But before I get all the way over there, if you can get Jalen Hurts style numbers out of any one of these dudes, you're going to be golden. You're going to be fine. Right. I think you're going to be in a really good spot. Okay, number three on the list, Georgia. All right. Now, everybody that I trust over in Athens will tell me straight up and down. Carson Beck will start the season as the starting quarterback at the University of Georgia. Why didn't Kirby Smart just come out and say that then? Because everybody's sure, except perhaps Kirby Smart, right? Now, you watch the spring game, you could see that Carson Beck had commanded the offense. He knew what was coming. He was in sync with Mike Bobo. And you could understand how the guy that doesn't turn the ball over, the guy that manages the offense, is the guy that Kirby Smart wants to be starting. Plus, he's a fourth-year quarterback, and that's a lot for Kirby. He likes to let the guy that's, Way out in front in as far as uh, being into the system, be the guy. Not unlike Mike Gundy at Oklahoma State. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But I also think it's interesting that both Beck and third-year quarterback Brock Vandegrift split reps in the spring. So Vandegrift, the only five-star of that group, that includes Gunnar Stockton, getting as many reps as Carson Beck means, hey, we're going to give the dude for Prince Avenue Christian every opportunity to beat out Carson Beck, especially because he's a third-year guy. And there are also some really interesting notes to add about Vandegrift, who I got to know as he was being recruited to Oklahoma, ends up committing to Oklahoma, decommitting from Oklahoma, ends up at Georgia. So he grew up an Auburn fan in Georgia, which I find fascinating. And he had not been to a game at Sanford until he was recruited. And that was when it flipped for him. He wanted to be a Georgia Bulldog then which is another reason why we invest so much time and energy into talking about recruiting because it really does matter. You grew up an Auburn fan and ended up with Georgia, knowing that if he'd have gone to Auburn, he probably would have been starting two years ago, 
but it'd also be Auburn. He wouldn't have two national championship ranks, right? I also think it's interesting that he shares living space, you know, rooms with Brock Bowers. Brock Bowers is the best tight end in the country. Some would say the best pass catcher in the country. Knowing that you eat and breathe with that dude, I'd like to see what Brock Bowers thinks about who should be the starting quarterback because that chemistry really does matter. You see that a, a theme of this show and a theme that I really much, very much believe in is the more time that a quarterback and a wide receiver or pass catcher spend together, the better that duo is, right? Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase over at LSU becomes a Super Bowl uh, participant, excuse me, at the Bengals, right? Marvin Harrison, Kyle McCord won three state titles at Philadelphia at St. Joe's before they got to Ohio State, right? I'm looking at Brock Bowers, looking at Brock Vandegrift, and I'm going, ooh, two Brocks that live together. One dude who is unstoppable as a tight end, and the other guy that's got five-star skills. Maybe you want to see what they can do together. I also think it's really interesting that Brock Vandegrift will graduate from Georgia in three years, right? Which means that at the end of this year, he could be a grad transfer. And if they still ain't got their dude over at Alabama, I would be shocked to find out that we don't hear more about tampering, right? And I say that knowing that the story about Kirby Smart leaving the job at Alabama to go to Georgia is one that Alabama fans still hold on. I don't know if there's any truth to it, but the rumor was large enough, so I'm not going to repeat it. All to say, everybody is trying to win, right? And I also thought this quote from Vandegrift about how Coach Smart is picking the quarterback he said Coach Smart and not Coach Bobo, hello, right, is telling. So the quote that he gave to dognation.com is, Coach Smart, he's going to put the best guy out there. He's going to give the best guy that gives Georgia the best chance to win. He's going to be out there. It's just being in this competition is being a blessing. He's saying all the right things, what I'm saying, right? He's saying all the right things. He's doing all the right things. And quiet as it is kept, his father, Greg Vandegrift, He's an outstanding high school football coach over at Prince Avenue. Got to know him a little bit. And one of the things that he very much loved about high school football in Georgia is they basically play it seven months a year, right? Like they can start playing preseason football in July. It's one of the reasons that Georgia football is so good and why everybody goes there to get players. And his dad is a defensive-minded coach, which is another way of saying Brock knows how to read defenses, right? So he's not coming in there as an also-ran. I think if something happens – you want to have both Carson Beck and Brock Vandegrift ready to go. And that is a theme that we're seeing throughout college football, which leads me to number four on the list, Ole Miss. I think the guy's Jackson Dart. I think the guy's Jackson Dart because after the spring game, Lane Kiffin in his opening statement, which means unprompted, had this to say. We obviously kind of moved the scoreboard there at the end just to have some fun, to make it a one-score game instead of a two-score game. And that was good to see Jackson – and his team respond to that and go down and score. Okay, I've given you the setup. I've also given you the punch of name-checking the starting quarterback from last year. Now, later on in responding to questions about evaluating this loaded quarterback room that includes not just Jackson Dart, but Walker Howard and Spencer Sanders, who's grad transferring from Oklahoma State, he said, so the idea was an offseason to improve that room. Make it competitive, bring guys in. It's not just competitive like everybody else thinks for the first spot. It's just to make the room better, okay? I made the analogy yesterday when people say, well, why do you add these guys when you only have one quarterback play at a time? I say, okay, well, do you like having really good pitchers on a baseball team? You like to have more than one. I wouldn't use a pitching staff to refer to my quarterback room, but his point is taken. Right, something happens in far as injuries. Something happens in, in as far as one guy's in sync in preseason, another guy is not. You want to have a talented quarterback room. Everybody does, and with the transfer portal, you can go pick and choose the guys you want to have in your room. I think that that is going to make Jackson Dart a better quarterback. But I believe he will start the season as a starting quarterback, and if he should fall off, then maybe we'll see Walker Howard or even Spencer Sanders. But knowing that you got a really good group of quarterbacks in that room also means that your practice squad, your scout team is going to be very, very good. And what do you need in the SEC West to be good? A very good football team all the way down the roster. So any place you can improve feels like a place you should. And that's how I read Lane Kiffin's room and why I am settled on Jackson Dart being the guy. All things are open, but that's who I would pick right now, right? 
And then last on the list for me, and the most interesting among these quarterback derbies to watch, UCLA. UCLA has perhaps four guys that could start, but three guys that I think actually have a job at it, right? Justin Martin being the fourth guy out. It's a former four-star and outstanding quarterback in himself. But you brought in a transfer in Colin Schley from Kent State. You have Ethan Garbers, who's been in your system for three years and been watching Dorian Thompson Robinson do the job. And you've got the stud, five-star from Detroit out of Martin Luther King High School in Dante Moore. Now, I can understand why you would be tempted to go with the dude that has played starting football the most, right, in Colin Schley. 11 games last year for the Golden Flashes, 2,000 yards, passing 13 TDs, 5 picks, 59% completion. Also, not a terrible runner, 710 rush yards over his career, and coming with a knowledge of an offense that really, really works. Like, and the way I put it, this is Sean Lewis is new offense coordinator, Colorado. Okay. So when he was at Kent State, co-defensive coordinator Todd Bates at Oklahoma went to seek out Sean Lewis because they were going so quick and they were being so prolific in how they got up and, up and down on the ball that they just wanted to talk, right? And it kind of became something like a bidding war for services for Sean Lewis until Deion Sanders was able to secure him for Colorado. So now you have real institutional knowledge from Schley about what that offense looked like. And a guy like Chip Kelly, who has something of an offensive genius himself, might see something he could do with any number of those quarterbacks. But I also think that having Schley there is going to be a lot like having Spencer Sanders over at Oklahoma State. You like having that dude. I don't know that you want that dude to start. You want your more talented quarterback to go beat them out. Or in a guy like Ethan Garbers, you want him to show everybody that, no, 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 I'm the guy. I've been here long enough. And it's not just that I've been here long enough. It's that I have used my time here to establish a lead in why I should be the starting quarterback. And your play will, will define that. But I think Dante Moore is the guy that everybody wants to do this. Because, frankly, if Dante Moore is not the starter in 2024 for UCLA going into the Big Ten, something has gone terribly wrong. It's just what it is, right? I also think that Chip Kelly is the guy that will pick a guy early and stick with him because that's exactly what he did with DTR, right? Dorian Thompson Robinson became the first five-year starter in the history of the sport because of the COVID years, right? And the way that we could look at eligibility and rules. I think the earlier you, you get Dante Moore into the system and make him the guy and get everybody used to rallying around him, the better off you're going to be in the future. Now, does that mean you're going to win a bunch of games this year? Maybe. He's talented enough to pick it up, and I think you go with that. You go with the ceiling, you go with the upside, and you try to build a football team that can take care of Dante in this first year, should it be him. Also, add in here, anybody who plays quarterback at UCLA is going to get to throw the football to Kyle Ford, who transferred over from USC. Kyle Ford's a player, okay? Uh, that, that, that's just what it is. So I'm excited to see what the Bruins can do. And I also want to make this point because close the loop on this, and I, and I, I sold this to open. Spring football – absolutely matters for these quarterbacks because we went into the spring period expecting to see a bunch of derbies go into the summer. Let me tell you about the ones that got settled during the spring. Sam Hartman won the job at Notre Dame. That's why Tyler Buckner entered the transfer portal and why he came out at Alabama. Sam Hartman transferred in from Wake Forest's grad transfer and with the ACC all-time TD record of 110 plus, probably going to stretch that. He looked good in their nasty spring game, <laughs> nasty meaning the weather, not the way the uh, sport was played. But you can understand how that might have gone into the spring if Tyler Buckner showed anybody that he was capable of beating up Sam Hartman, right? At Illinois, Luke Altmyer, who transferred away from Ole Miss to get a shot, has become the dude quick, fast, in a hurry almost as soon as he got there in January. Cade McNamara to Iowa. We already knew that that was probably going to happen, but it's good to see that Kirk Ferentz sees what he needs to out of a guy that's won a Big Ten championship and a guy that's played in the college football playoff. Drew Alar, who is kind of like Dante Moore in a year, right? You got to sit behind Sean Clifford. You got in there for a couple of games, or a couple, I should say not games, but plays, when Clifford was down with an injury. And everybody got to see the talent that he has. And he's got an outstanding backfield. I think the three best backfields in the sport are all in the Big Ten. Good God. I just said that out loud. Now I'm thinking about it, and I'm so right. Uh, Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, good Lord. And then you're going to have a lot of help. Deontay Cephas is going to help them over the summer. They got Keandre Lambert-Smith. He's going to be in a good spot, but that was a, I could have kept going. We got Quinn Ewers at Texas. All of a sudden, all the people that were telling me that Arch Manning could beat out Quinn Ewers were telling me that there was no chance that he was ever going to get out Quinn Ewers. And now that they've seen the spring game, they will all run and fall in line with the Malik Murphy take that I had two years ago. 
literally two years ago. Just go check it out on the channel. Been talking about Malik Murphy till I'm blue in the face. Talking about Josh Allen and Malik Mur Murphy till I'm blue in the face. But that's Quinn Ewers' squad now. I'm very excited to see what he could do with Bryant Denny when they go to Alabama later in the summer, or excuse me, summer, in September, which I guess is summer. Tanner Mordecai at Wisconsin, he threw four picks in that game. They still feel good about him being the starter uh, going into this season. Hudson Carter, Purdue, I didn't think you were going to be able to do better at quarterback than Aiden O'Connell was last year and the year before, but I think you got it because Hudson Carr can move around. I'm very excited to see what Graham Harrell gives to the Big Ten, a traditional three yards in a cloud of dust conference that has been airing it out for the last five to ten years, right? Excited to see how that goes, especially with Ryan Walters as the head coach because that defense in 2021, excuse me, 2022, was outstanding, right? We saw a bunch of guys drafted off of it. Uh, let me see. What else did we have? For nope. No, that's it. But, I mean, goodness me, I'm counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine dudes want a starting job in the spring? That's reason enough to say the spring football matters, does it not? Because I think spring football matters. Certainly matters in the USFL. Bang! Two for two. On the segues. Hell yeah. We're moving right along. You can see I'm fired up about today. Fired up about today, and I'll tell you why I'm fired up about today at the end of the show, I promise. But let's go with number one. We got a new number one. I'm going to make some people mad. I got the Houston Gamblers. As the number one team in my power rank is heading into the halfway mark of the USFL season. They have won three games in a row. They are very much in a spot to win a playoff spot in the South Division, which we thought was going to belong to Birmingham and then the New Orleans Breakers. And honestly, it's about Mark Thompson for them. Because when Mark Thompson has played football for the Houston Gamblers, they have won three games. When he has not played football, they have lost two games. And they also played an outstanding game last week in their 27-20 to 20 win against the Birmingham Stallions. They did not pick up a single penalty, right? And they did not turn the ball over once. That is a coach's wet dream. Full stop. Curtis Johnson's got to be very happy with the gamblers where they are. Number two on the list for me, the New Orleans Breakers, who took their first loss of the season, and there are no more undefeated teams in the USFL. They got beat 27-10 to 10 by the Showboats. Hello? A team that was dead last in these power rankings after week one got beat down 42-2 to two by the Stallions, showed up to knock off the 4-0 Breakers. Very excited about them. We'll talk about them a little bit later on. But the Breakers still have a great football team. Russ Hills is tied with Mark Thompson for the most rushing TDs on, of any player this season. It's at eight. Last year, Darius Victor won that rushing TD title with nine. So we're already getting much better football. Number three on the list. Birmingham Stallions, who took the loss to the Gamblers. Skip holds the Stallions 14 and 3 since the return of the US fell. Problem with that is that they've won, they, excuse me, they've lost two games, right, in their last three outings. And you can't keep that up and expect to win what I think is a really great South Division. I mean, think about it. We got three of the four South Division teams inside of our top three of the USFL power ranks. Then number four, yeah, let's go four for four on the South Division because the Memphis Showboats have won two in a row. That's called a winning streak, right? They're on to something. I'm actually headed to Memphis this weekend to see the showboats and a couple of other games. I'm very excited to see what I find because Todd Haley is an outstanding football coach. Carnell Lake's defense is playing lights out football. Show Cole Kelly is showing up because I tell you, man, nobody loves a tall quarterback more than Brock Heward and Joel Klatt. I mean, head over heels for the 6'7 FCS All-American out of Southeastern uh, Louisiana. But he went 24-36 for 224 with a TD in that game. And that Memphis defense became the first to hold New Orleans to under 250 yards passing in a game. Number five, the New Jersey Generals. They lost 24-21 to the Stars. It's their second loss in a row, right? That's the first time that that has happened to the Generals since the USFL returned. This is a team that lost one game in the regular season last year. Have already lost three through the first half of the season. Hey, they got some work to do. I think they can get it figured out, but it's really about playing clean football, penalties, turnovers, those sorts of things. Number six, we got the Pittsburgh Maulers, who are two and three. They won 23-7 against the Panthers last week, uh, and my goodness, doubled their win total for 2022. Number seven, we got the Philadelphia Stars, who had eight field goals to score 24 points in a 24-21 to victory against the Generals. I mean, Luis Aguilar is outstanding. Like, kicker, eight for eight, he'll take that. Also, the game winner... Three seconds left on the clock. He nailed a 55-yarder to win them the game in regulation. But the problem is the offensive line is not good. They're on pace to give up 40 sacks in a 10-game season. 
Case Cookies, man. You got to keep him upright. You want to win some football games. Number eight, we got the Michigan Panthers. Lost 23-7 to seven to the Maulers. They have lost three in a row now. But the good news for the North Division is you're all two and three. Everybody in the North Division has an opportunity to make the playoff. And after what I just showed you with this top four, everybody in the South Division has an opportunity to make the playoff. So we got a lot of football left to play in the USFL with five weeks of the regular season left. All right. That is is going to do it for this episode of the number one college football show. My thanks as always to our lead producer, Tyler Wojak. Our social maiden is Javion Duncan. Our director today is Gabe Gross-Sable. Our production assistant is Kiara Santana. That is Chris Cheshire in AD chair. Very excited to have him back on the show. Our senior producer is Catherine Donnelly. I'm the host, RJ, and I'm very excited because I re-signed with Fox Sports today to do this right here. Yankees job. Having a great time, guys. All right. We will see y'all on Friday. Deuces.